a large group of people who were buying a lot of guns in a, a short period of time, and then we were having recoveries in Mexico. What we had was purchases in the U.S., recoveries in Mexico. We didn't have what was in between, and that's what the agents in Phoenix were trying to prove. So you all thought this was a great idea? To stop guns to go into Mexico? No, yes, ma'am. This, this particular investigation of, of letting guns walk into Mexico. We didn't have an investigation to let guns walk. We had an investigation into a group of individuals who were breaking the law and trafficking guns into right, Mexico. All right, so 2,000 guns walked into Mexico. You've retrieved maybe 300, is that correct? I, I believe the current number is uh, roughly 600 firearms have been recovered. And my understanding is that the way you were, quote, surveilling them was that you were putting GPS systems on them. Is that correct? On the firearms or on, on, on vehicles? It depends on. We, we used all kinds of, of investigative techniques to, to further investigation to try to determine if, in fact, the firearms were going to Mexico. Would the gentlelady yield? We have previous testimony that three times and only three times were any uh, electronic tracking devices placed on the products. Only three times? Yes, yeah, correct. And that those batteries ran out is what I was told as well. Exactly. Is that correct? All right. Um, what Peter Forcelli, the special agent, testified earlier said that, in his opinion, you know, if we monitor money being wired to the Middle East and we take down actual information about people who buy Sudafed, because we are concerned about meth labs. We know that gun running is coming from the United States into Mexico. That is the source of it. Why aren't we required, why aren't we requiring people who purchase multiple long arms from reporting that? And my question to each of you is, should we be doing that? We do it for things like Sudafed, but we don't do it for long arms. I believe that uh, well, we, we put forward a demand letter requiring gun dealers along the southwest border to report the sale of two or more uh, firearms that fire from the shoulder uh, greater than 22 caliber to accept a detachable magazine. And what is the penalty if they don't? Uh, the FFL doesn't. It will be part of the revocation process if they don't they, follow oh, our so rules. They would lose their license. Correct. That is like a slap on the hand, isn't it? Well, that is all we have uh, at our disposal I'm asking to you, do. I am asking you if there should be a law passed requiring the reporting of long arms that exceed a certain number. I think that is the job of this no, body. No, we are asking you. You're, you're out in, you are out in the field. You are telling us that the gun running into Mexico, the drug cartels are getting those guns from the United States. They are originating here. So I want everyone on the panel to just answer that question. The Re demand, yes demand letter no. 3 that is going forward is a, a, going to be an also a great tool for us to All right. combat this. Ms. Mr. Newell. Well, thank you, Congressman. Uh, yes, any tool that we have to assist us in detecting early on, to detect, help us assist to detect early on a firearms trafficking organization that is trafficking in large quantities of multiple say, of, of, multi, of assault type Next. weapons would help. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think that if we are going to do this, it should be in a balanced approach, maybe through le legislation. But we also got to take in mind that this, uh, we do have Second Amendment rights, and this needs to be balanced. And uh, I think that uh, we should be approach this with caution. Well, what does that mean? Either you that think means we, that we should have one or there, we should? There is a common good in this, this idea, in this legislation, but there is a responsibility for us to balance it also. Next. Yes, ma'am. It would help. Yes, ma'am. I agree with uh, Mr. Ledman, though. We need to uh, balance it uh, with uh, Second Amendment rights. Um, we require uh, purchases of handguns uh, within more, two or more handguns within a five-day period to be reported to us. However, the situation in Mexico right now and along the southwest border, I think it is an exigency that, uh, that we have some type of, uh, well, some help along that line with the uh, assault weapons or uh, the long guns. Uh, I would disagree to some extent that uh, that would be beneficial. I would rather have a relationship with the Federal Firearms Licensee for when an individual does come in and want, wants to purchase multiple weapons of any sort, uh, handguns or long guns, that they would uh, work with us on that, and that would provide us the, uh, some information targeting those individuals. So I would somewhat disagree with that. My time has expired. I thank the gentlelady. We now go to the gentleman, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I, I thank you for also uh, giving us the opportunity to go to Mexico City and, and meet with the officials down there, both our hardworking agents uh, um, and agencies, as well as the uh, Federal Police uh, in, in Mexico. Uh, I just, uh, uh, hearing some of the uh, responses this morning, I, 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 I'm kind of surprised that the Mexico Federal Police met us with such uh, openness in providing information to us of what they are attempting to do uh, when uh, it is apparent we let them down. Um, I, I guess to try to get at, um, come at it from the other side to get some answers, um, let me ask uh, uh, Mr. Canino, uh, and thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, when did you first learn that a large number of guns were being seized in Mexico and traced back to Phoenix? Well, sir, it was around uh, November or so. Uh, my intel uh, officer in Mexico reported to me that there was a large amount of weapons uh, in the suspect gun database. Um, what, was your reaction, what was your reaction to that? Well, sir, I, I looked at it. Um, I, I thought three things about this case. Uh, number one, I thought that uh, the case was out of Phoenix. Anybody who has ever talked to any agents in Phoenix or worked in Phoenix knows that the U.S. Attorney's Office there has been reluctant to prosecute firearms cases. That is number one. Number two, I thought that our agents in Phoenix had stumbled upon a gun trafficking group and in their due diligence were finally realizing, okay, these guys beat us for these many guns. And number three, I thought somehow our agents are losing these loads or a combination of all three. Never, never. In my wildest dreams, would I think that ATF agents were ordered or participated in actually following known gun traffickers and just walking away? That is, to me, inconceivable. And to this day, I still am trying to get my, my head around this. What happened in this case is this is the ATF gun trafficking book, something we have done since 1972, and we do it well. And they went in Phoenix to the shredder and shredded the best practices, all the techniques that you use to investigate a gun trafficking case. It is not rocket science. If it was, I wouldn't be here. Had you, had you received any warning from ATF in Phoenix or Washington about the possibility of a spike in guns showing up in Mexico? No, well, I was you know, talking with Lauren and, and the folks at the Office of Strategic Intelligence. You know, we became aware, okay, there is a gun trafficking case in Phoenix. Uh, the first guns that I became aware of uh, that were related to that case were in November of 2009, uh, where nine guns turned up in a seizure of 42 guns in Sonora, Mexico. So no warning. Uh, once those guns came up and we traced them, hey, okay, now we found out there was a case out of Phoenix. But out of that case, out of those nine guns, that person who purchased those nine guns purchased close to 700 guns. So in 2009, we knew, we meaning ATF, ATF Phoenix, ATF uh, Mexico, we knew that at least one person involved in that case had guns recovered in Mexico. And like I said, that person was allowed to buy 700 guns. 700 guns. Mr. Gill, let, let, me, let me ask you the same questions. Um, when did you first learn that a large number of guns were being seized in Mexico and traced back to Phoenix? Sir, I, I learned actually uh, during the same uh, event that uh, Mr. Canino just referred to. Uh, he and uh, my chief analyst, uh, Dennis Fasciani, came to my office. and uh, I had just arrived in early October, and this event came across, and uh, so they briefed me at that time. And your reaction to that? Uh, I, I picked up the phone. Uh, we discussed it. I picked up the phone. I called the Phoenix Field Division to find out what was going on with this investigation. We, we were recovering uh, an abnormal number of weapons, and uh, if they were aware of it, and if so, what was going on? And you, and you received no warning prior to that? No, sir. Um, in, in a few remaining seconds, let, let me move over to um, uh, uh, Mr. Ledman. Uh, what is E-Trace? It is the ATF's uh, electronic tracing system. It is uh, well, the uh, system we use to, to submit, submit traces and to get the results. 
Um, was the database useful for tracing guns, or did you find, face obstacles with the tracing system? Well, within the tracing system, we have a flagging system called suspect guns. And in that suspect gun database, right, it's utilized to um, notify case agents when a weapon that they suspect is uh, being used in a criminal, uh, a crime gun, that uh, it's flagged and the, the uh, agent's notified. Were there any delays in the usage of E-Trace on this particular issue? No, the, the tracing comes out of especially the Mexico guns or the U.S. guns. That comes from the recovering officers or, or their agency. But uh, the flagging system uh, has a, um, a mechanism in it, or it did in the inception of uh, Gunrunner, I mean, excuse me, project, uh, this project, uh, Fast and Furious. It had a system that wasn't, elect you know, we couldn't have it through our electronic system. Halfway why, through, why was that? It was just a, a matter of just merging us, the systems together. It is now part of our E-Trace system, and it is all fully available. The gentleman's time has expired. We now go to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I apologize. There's several committee meetings going on. So if I ask a question that's been answered, uh, I apologize. But perhaps it's just the most obvious. Special Agent McMahon, was it your intention to go back and get these weapons after this all took place? People left these stores with guns. Your intention was to go back and get those, all these weapons, correct? Our intention was to prove that they were doing something illegally when they bought those weapons, and that's, that's easier said than done. Um, proving that someone's a straw purchaser actually means that you have to prove the day that they came in to fill out that form that they lied when they answered one of the questions. And proving that, we have to prove that they knowingly lied when they filled out that form. So once we've determined that someone is a straw purchaser, yes, we want to be able to get the weapons that they've responsible for as quick as possible. Did you believe that you could get these weapons back if that was the case, regardless of where they went? Well, again, I think our problem with this case is proving that a violation occurred in the U.S. and then determining how those weapons were being transported into Mexico. We know that of all the people we identified in this case, our purchasers, none of them were actually physically taking the weapons into Mexico. We, didn't, we were checking border crossings, all of those sort of things, and that was not happening. So there was a great unknown at the beginning of this case trying to figure out what, this, what the size of this network was and how it was operating. Both you and Special Agent Newell have uh, used the line, if we pick off one or two straw purchasers today, they simply get replaced. In your words, in your mind, why is that the case? Well, because I, I think the way I understand firearms trafficking in Mexico, which is totally different than any type of firearms trafficking we have ever done before. I am from New York. I work firearms trafficking cases all the time. But it is totally different in Mexico. What you have is a plaza boss that orders guns from the U.S. He will give someone in the U.S., say, $70,000 and says, I want $70,000 a gun. And he expects to get $70,000 with and guns. And how do they find each other, typically? Well, then that person will have their oh, th — that is an established network from the drug trade of gun drugs going north. So that individual — I'm sorry. So that relationship is already there because of the drug trade? Absolutely. And then that person will recruit individuals that have clean records that are U.S. citizens to buy weapons. Now, if we start picking off one or two people, that hurts the money person in the U.S., but the person in Mexico is still going to get his $70,000 worth of guns. And that is what happens. So knocking off straw purchasers one by one.